when my daughter and I flew over to the Ukraine to join some young graduate doctors and engineers from various countries within the continent of Africa, we had no idea that less than three years later, the country would have been invaded and literally decimated by war. A war that would not only affect the Ukraine, but also many other countries across the globe. If you've never been to the Ukraine and you're curious about our trip there before the war, then watch this video. Hey there, welcome back to my YouTube channel. This is Angie Marie. And on this channel, we share tips on how to retain joy and happiness through deliberate actions such as travel, finances, relationships, and taking care of our emotional, physical, mental, and spiritual health. Just a couple of years before the war in the Ukraine, my daughter and I traveled there and we witnessed the graduation ceremony of several doctors and engineers from across Africa who studied there. I also had the privilege of hosting a four hour seminar for these doctors where I shared some thoughts and ideas with them on three main topics. In the process, however, I learned a lot. And so this video will do two things. One, it will provide snippets of what I shared with a group of doctors, but along the way, you will see seven things I discovered in the process from this very interesting and life-changing trip. If you are a returning subscriber, I'm very happy to have you back. And if this is your first time, I'm elated to have you. I invite you to subscribe, like this video, and especially I look forward to your comments on the video, your thoughts and ideas. I would love to engage with you. So welcome again, take careful notes, and let me hear your thoughts. Good day to you friends, and how are you doing today? As I am here in the most relaxed city of ivano Frankivs in the Ukraine in Eastern Europe, I decided to take a moment out to just share a quick word with you. There's a part of our body that I believe is the most demanded part, and that part of the body is demanded by so many sectors that I think it's worthwhile to say something about it. And that part of the body is our hand. Our hands are powerful. Don't believe me? Okay, the nail salon requires our hands to do manicures and then they tell us, we think this is gonna make us beautiful. For men who think this does not apply to them, the word handsome includes hand. So the men are also handsome, which suggests something about their hand. Border control officers require us to do our fingerprinting because they believe that once they get those fingerprints, we know it assists in the security of the country. How about the law enforcement officers who when someone gets in trouble, the first thing they do is put those hands behind us and apply what we call handcuffs. Disciplinarians such as our principals, school teachers and our parents often ask young children to stretch forth their hands and they apply the rod of correction so that that mistake or that error that they made would not happen again. We raise our hands in worship. Even the Creator above appreciates the lifted hands. Lovers want us to show that we love them by holding their hands. Even the palm readers want to convince us that they can tell something about our past, our present, or future by reading what is in our hands. Diplomats use handshakes as a sign of respect. Friends, we hug each other with the use of our hands. So there's absolutely no doubt that those hands are demanded by so many different groups of people. I want to tell us something about a man who was born many, many years ago during a period of very serious genocide. His name is Moses. He was born before any of us was born. And at that time, when he was born, the king had decreed that every firstborn male child should be killed. Now, we won't go into the details of the story except to say that his mother decided, not my son. So she orchestrated a plan to protect her son so that he wouldn't be killed. And it turns out that this boy Moses ended up in the same palace of the king who had decreed that all firstborn male children should be killed. 
But God had a plan behind it all because he had decided that Moses was going to be the deliverer of his people who were in slavery. So when God met with Moses, he gave him the assignment. Moses said, listen, I'm not eloquent. I stutter. I'm a stammerer and cannot do this job. And there is a very interesting question that God asked Moses. And the question was, hey, Moses, what is that in your hand? And what was in Moses' hand was a staff. Then God told him, throw it to the ground. When Moses did that, all sorts of miracles happened. And Moses then was empowered to go and deliver the people using that staff. And I want to say to all of us, friends, that what is in those hands of ours will make up and override and supersede any perceived deficiencies that we think we have or that other people think we have. Whether it be our speech or our beauty or something we think we don't have, there's something that we do have. Every one of us have been given talents. We have our brains, we have our minds, but then there's something that we need to translate and transfer what is in the brain and the mind to the hands and to make something useful of those hands. My challenge and my charge to you, to me, to all of us is let us use our hands. Whatever we find our hands to do, let us do it. Whether it be for cooking, baking, for making clothes as a seamstress, for helping the poor, starting a business, preaching, doing a ministry. Let us use our hands for our own benefit and to the glory of our Father in heaven. Let us have a can-do spirit and my charge is let us use our hands. Thank you so much. God bless you. In the next segment, I've pieced together aspects of points made during the seminar. So take a listen. As a doctor, you need your hands. You need your hands. You're going to be using those hands with a stethoscope, with all sorts of instruments to assess people. Your hands represent competence. Your hands represent power. In those hands, there is healing. It is, it is your hands that's going to help you to become wealthy. So what's in your hands? Everything is in your hands. There's a lot in your hands. We're never going to underestimate the power of our hands. You need your hands. And of course, lovers. Baby, let me hold your hand. <laughs> and especially if you see your rival, she, is she looking? You want the boy to hold your hand to prove that you're the main Squeeze, or whatever. <laughs> why is that? Is it the truth? <laughs> or, or am I telling the secrets to the guys? <laughs> well, guys, listen. The girls want you to hold their hands, especially when the other girl who they think like you or you probably haven't, they want you to hold their hands so the other person can see that you're special. Wow. Aha. <laughs> you're gonna learn. Yeah. Right. Find the Bible by the name of Moses. Moses was born in a time of serious genocide. Genocide. Yeah. Because the Pharaoh or the king at the time said, every firstborn male child that's born kills them. Serious is worse than Ebola. <laughs> oh, you didn't know Ebola had anything to do with gen genocide, right? It's worse than Rwanda, where these tribes were fighting and killing each other. Yeah. So, so Moses was born at a time of serious genocide where the king, the pharaoh himself said, every firstborn male child must be killed. Moses had a mother, which is kind of like most of us African mothers, who said, you're not getting my son. And the woman was so wise and so perceptive, she took the son and put him in a basket protected him and he wasn't killed and that boy ended up in the palace. The same king, the same people who said we want him dead, ended up raising him up. And so Moses was raised in the palace and there came a time when God, God knew what he was doing. And I'm going to show you, I'm going to show you that you all, every single one of you are just like Moses. You don't have to come to me and say, Ma Angie, I've been through some things. 
No. I know. How do I know? Because from history, from the Bible and everything, nobody who has been taken from their place of origin to another place and brought up like you to in a position of respect and authority like doctors, there is not one person like that who has not had serious challenges. So every single one of you have been through challenge because God is never gonna raise up somebody, especially take them from their home, their comfort zone, and take them to another place that is so different from home, take you through the snow, take you through all of that where you have to be shivering in with, and you better make sure you come to, oh sorry, I'm talking like a Jamaican. Make sure you attend, make sure you're at class on time or else you're gonna be shut out. Or you, God allows that to happen because you are special. Or I don't know what the process was in your country for you to come here. There might have been 635 applicants and yet, Aram was selected. Fenny was selected. And somebody paid. Samuel was selected. Yeah. Was selected. So God had a plan. In the same way, there was a plan for Moses. What's in your hands as doctors will make up for your perceived deficiencies. What's in your hands will make up for your perceived deficiencies. Whatever you feel is a deficiency or what is seen to be a deficiency, God is saying, what's in your hands will supersede and make up for all those deficiencies. So there's no time for any excuses. I don't care if you stutter. Whatever was the lecturers put some things in your brain, okay, and books, and now you're going back home to take it from there. You're making a transition. Our hands are given to us as gifts to give to the world, not to stick in our pockets. No, I'm putting my hands in my pocket so that you'll see that my dress has pockets. No, that's not the reason. Our hands are given to us as gifts so that we can give to other people. And I want you to do something for me, please. I, can I ask all of you to stand? And I want you to find another. Please just stand up. Look in the eyes of another doctor. Even if that person didn't finish, shake their hands and say that there is healing in your hands. That's right. There is favor in your hands. There is favor in your hands. <laughs> jobs but in America. Answering the phones, robotics is a big thing and you know whatever happens over there it eventually trickles down. I have robotic medicine now. Yeah. Before I came here, I wanted to test it on Google. One morning I said, hey Google, and it didn't say Whitney, it says, how may I help you? <laughs> I didn't get my name called, you know. I said, if I'm having a headache and don't feel, what should I do? Would you believe that Google told me? Oh, he was about acetaminophen and all the butts. You should, if you take this, you should do this. I'm like, oh my gosh. So Google is competing with you guys. <laughs> <laughs> Serious. So you have some competition. And in addition to all of that, you guys, when you go back, some of you have been here for seven years. During those seven years, there are other doctors who stayed and you know, you're gonna compete with them, you're gonna learn from them. Mm -hmm. In the same way, you're not competing against your colleagues, right? Mm -hmm. you, you, you learn from when you can't figure out a particular difficult case, your colleagues will help you. There are three challenges that I want to give to you now about dealing with those being the doctor of choice. 
three things. The first thing I, I, I want you to think about is your mindset. Your mindset. Your mindset about yourself, your competence, your abilities, you have learned, you can do it. Your mindset about yourself, your mindset about the institution that you're assigned to, and your mindset about your, pa your patients. I don't know if any of you have ever been to the, a hospital in the Ukraine or so, but you know, I don't know if it's very good there and compared to, let's say, you're, you know, you're, you're from Abuja or Lagos or some village, someone told me the uh, place, I don't even know some of these names. Or you go, you're from, a, you go to Enkako in Ghana, <laughs> or the Brad Alpha region or some place. And you're like, oh God, what kind of hospital is it? Don't even have beds. No, don't do that. Let's be visionary. The beds will come. I want you to think about a positive mindset. How can we solve the, these problems in my country? Your mindset about yourself, okay, competence, I can do this. Anytime the voices come and tell you, ah, you don't know anything, this devil is alive. Your mindset about your patience. And that is a, the major one that, I think I want to say something to you now. Some years ago, my, my daughters were ages three, five, and seven at the time. So they were in the country, and outside of Kingston where, where we were from with their grandparents and <clears throat> at the time we were going to the country to pick them up in a car or driving and I was sitting on the right side passenger seat their father was driving and as we went along this highway all of a sudden a big tractor trailer truck did not stop at the intersection came straight across and believe me friends doctors I saw I thought to my, I saw, what is, you know, before my, I said, oh my God, is this going to stop? Is, is it going to crash? I didn't, I was never, I didn't become unconscious, but there was a, the car hit, and it hit right into my side of the car. And that accident caused, there was, well, you know what I mean by the femur, because you're a doctor, so I broke uh, the, this right leg in more than one places. And the doctor said it's a comminuted, I remember, fracture. The, the, we were on the highway and I remember the windows was up because of the AC, people smashed the window, pulled me out. I don't know if when they pulled me through the window with a broken bone, it also probably caused, but thank God they got me to the hospital, both of us. He got a broken elbow and so on. And I, before that, I've never had anything to do with being hospitalized before except three normal deliveries with my children. So now I had to face some doctors and I believe that part of the reason I went through what I went through with my surgeries, I've had three surgeries on this leg. All right, so let's move on. So anyway, you'll hear more. So that um, accident caused me to have more interaction with doctors and I've seen different types of doctors. So what I want to challenge you with is to become a doctor like this doctor his name is Dr. Tawala. Can anybody guess where you think Dr. Tawala came from? India. India, how do you know? Hey. Dr. Tawala is an Indian doctor who live, works in New York, and if you Google search him, Rupesh, well, if I told you the first name, maybe you would have known quicker. If you Google search Dr. Rupesh Tawala, it tells you that he is a top orthopedic surgeon, New York surgeon. Uh, this was a nice Indian accent. But guess what? His accent didn't matter. His accent has nothing. When you go and do uh, look on Google, he has excellent reviews. That he is, he's a doctor of first class. First class. Dr. Tawala, the third surgeon who operated here. And there were some things that Dr. Tawala did that I want you to think about. His mindset was such that he didn't con concern himself about accent. Dr. Tawala knew that he has been given something. He knew he's been given something, given something um, that he can transfer to us. His mindset. The second thing I want to ask you to do is to headset and handset 
both of them, what I'm trying to do here is to talk about the communication. The headset is cordless, but it's used to communicate. And the handset is the old type of phone that it's also used to communicate, but a different type of, of phone, but both of them are communication. The challenge is how you communicate with your patients. Be positive. The first surgeon who saw me, now truthfully, my situation was serious. And that doctor, he kept saying, oh, this is very serious. You know, we're not sure what we're gonna do with you, you know? Then they put me on the bed and put my foot up in some stirrups. Some of elevated. And it took them a couple of days before they did the first surgery. And every single night, almost, I kept dreaming because I used to run. I was a champion runner in my, when I was younger. I kept dreaming that I was running and running upstairs and when I woke up I said, like, oh I'm on a bed <laughs> and this leg won't even move. I've had that doctor, there's another doctor who saw me for the second surgery, he was more positive, but Dr. But doctor Tawala said something, he said, listen, I can fix this, I can correct it, just uh, in a, he told me how many weeks, you'll be back, you'll be up and running. My daughter got married about six weeks after the surgery in December. I did the surgery in November, end of December. And I went to Dr. Tawala and I said, um, Doc, can I? I brought a picture of my shoes that I wanted to wear for the wedding. Can I wear this to the wedding? And he said, Dr. Tawala said, Oh, yeah, 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 that you can even dance. I wanted to take note. He said, You can even dance. And I looked at him like that. And he said, Yeah, five or ten minutes or how you feel comfortable. So guess what, because of Tawala, Dr. Tawala, now I dance. Woo! No! I just don't my legs! Hey, you should have seen me in my room. Put on my music every step you take. Every move you take. I, I, I mean, I've been dancing and my feet work. And it's been a long time that I didn't dance. But because of those words that was communicated to me, you can even dance. Now I dance. Now what I'm saying to you is, be like that doctor with your patients. It's not that you're fooling them and telling them something that's not so, right? I mean, probably the person is terminally ill, but find a way to be positive. Inspiring, because it does help the patient. The final thing is the typeset. And the typeset, I'm referring to records. Now, does anyone in the room notice anything common with all three? He said all of them has the word set at the end. Mindset, headset or handset, communication, typeset, the record keeping. It is very important to keep records, good, accurate records. I, I don't know if back home you, you know, you, that's a problem. But in America, a lot of things depend on medical records and the accuracy of those records. My nephew passed away some months ago, this year, suddenly. It was, he was not supposed to go, but that's how we feel. Um, and it was sudden. But the medical records showed that really he was not supposed to go. Because he made calls, he visited, he went to the emergency room, he did. And somehow they were, you know, somebody didn't do something they were supposed to do. Similarly, uh, with me, medical records. Right now, I'm, I'm able to get certain things done because of the records. No judge, no anything will listen to you without the medical. What does the medical report say? That's in this room, there are doctors who will not just be regular physicians, medical practitioners. There are surgeons. This room. Yeah. There are heart, heart surgeons, brain surgeons, pediatricians. You are sitting right in this room, but let me tell you, in this very room, there are people who are going to be building hospitals mm -hmm. in your I want 10 years from now, 12 years from now, I want to hear about it. Yes. Or even me, my daughters, my children, my grandchildren, we
we want to hear that. Remember, 10 years ago in Ukraine, you told me that we were gonna build a hospital, and I did it. I wanna hear, please. There are people in this room who will be educators, building medical schools, <laughs>
The hands are probably the most demanded part of your body.
this first happened not the moon, even before today. Before today. Ah, it is now that Dr. Tida draws the first. Dr. Tida. Mommy will present here. It's a very wonderful telescope.
this one. If you are not active in looks, then I need to move on. The next radio radio. Radio radio. It's a very wonderful, beautiful lady. She happens to be a general secretary for those in my life. Diana Beckham. Like to say God bless you and may your 
Here are the three topics we covered in this amazing seminar. Number one, becoming the doctor of choice in a highly competitive environment. Number two, money health. And number three, excelling against all odds in a foreign country. Unfortunately, Ukraine has now become a sad memory of a great experience. I still pray for the country and hope that one day there will be peace. The seven things I discovered from that Ukraine trip, three of them have to do with Ukraine and four have to do with the lessons I learned from my presentation. One, Ukraine provided tertiary educational opportunities to countries in Africa and elsewhere in the world at an affordable cost. Number two, Ukraine was very welcoming and kind to its visitors. My daughter and I felt that, especially at the hotels we stayed at. And when we had the seminar, we had the seminar at a hotel called Stanislav. And the service was excellent. The refreshments were good for our breaks. Um, I also stayed at the Nadia Hotel, two different hotels in, in the Ukraine. The, the service was really good, and this was before the war. And thirdly, Ukraine had great organic food. Their fruits and vegetables were just excellent. They did fruit juices. The, the service was really good and, and saddened really by what has happened over there. In number four, making the presentation, here's what I learned. Our accent is not a hindrance. I felt very welcomed, even though I was the only Jamaican there, the only person from America. They were very, my accent was not an impediment at all. Number five, when presenting ideas to groups, Take the time to connect with the group by breaking the ice. Thank them, show respect and genuine appreciation, get them involved and keep them interested in what you're sharing. Number six, share your story. Sharing your story brings connection and it helps to solidify the lessons being shared. And number seven, we are more alike than different. And I was very convinced of that. I'm traveling all over the world. I'm realizing that, yes, there are cultural differences, but uh, in a nutshell, as humans, we're more alike. We're more like each other than different. And when making a presentation to a group of persons from a different culture, highlight your similarities more. Do not highlight the differences. Highlight the similarities. This is Angie Marie, and I'm so grateful you stayed to the end of the video. Please go ahead and share your comments with me, like this video, and if you have not yet subscribed, go ahead and subscribe to my channel for more content.